and we'll get rolling. You guys ready? I am ready. Let's do it. All right. So the question on this, this whole thing was about, Hey, I'm curious about syndication. How does it work? You know, is it that whole thing? So Gino, you, you're famous for the mom and pop buy, right, manage, right, finance, right model, right? The whole wheelbarrow profits thing. That was you and Jake building your business to, I think a thousand, maybe 1200 units um, before, before you ever uh, uh, syndicated. Right. Yes. So kind of two part question. What is syndication and why did you wait until like the 1200 unit mark before you started syndicating? I could spend an hour talking about that, that question right there because the, the real answer is I didn't know what syndication was in the beginning, five, six years ago. That was not the key word. So five, six, seven years ago, there were deals in the market, but there was no money in the market. And the Jobs Act of 2012 had just passed. So it wasn't uh, one of those catchwords, right? People were doing it and they were doing it in different spaces, but not so much in syndication. So Jake and I just said, let's buy multifamily. You know, what, Jamie, what you don't know, you don't know. And, and I didn't know syndication. If I had known that looking back, I may have 4,000 units right now, but I don't think that's what God wanted me to do. So I didn't get into syndication. So I was fortunate enough to buy these properties and become really diligent at buying right. And, and now as we get into the market cycle, I want everyone to think about this. As you're analyzing deals in the Jake and Gino community, I tell all of our students the three pillars what Bill Ham talks about. We talk about market cycle, we talk about debt, and we talk about exit strategy. I want everyone, when you analyze a deal, focus on those three topics, right? Where are we in the market cycle? And every market is a little different. Michael Orlando, I know Michael, you're in Cleveland. Your market cycle is a little bit different than what's going on down south. You're more of a linear market, so you may not be in expansion hyper supply phase. I may be wrong with that. Um, so you really have to analyze where you are in the market. And on top of that, you have to get even more granular. Where in Cleveland, maybe downtown is a lot hotter than on the east side. The east side's hotter than the west side, whatever that is. So figure where you are in the market cycle. The next one is the debt component. What are you doing with debt? What kind of debt are you getting on? When we started back in 2013, one of the reasons why I didn't syndicate, I think also was I was using community debt. So I was getting recourse debt. It's hard to syndicate deals getting community financing. So that's what I ended up doing. I got community financing. And for me, it was a blessing because I got 25-year AMS. We rolled it into community the first time. And then we rolled it into agency. So it allowed me to do refi and roll. And we're doing both. And I think everyone on the call has to understand that syndication is only a tool in the toolbox. It's only one strategy, right? I think you can go out and syndicate deals. We're buying a deal right now in uh in Knoxville. It's a 52 unit deal. We're buying with students actually. We're not syndicating that deal. It's about a $4 million deal. We're JVing it. It's partners. It should be a nice, nice little turn on that one. Uh, we're buying a deal. We're put on the contract in Charleston. It's a nice property. Now the market cycle, Jamie, we've never bought a nice, really nice A property like this. It's a 2017 build. And this part of the market cycle, I'm a little wary of buying C assets right now that have a lot of CapEx for one reason. They're overpriced. I don't want to pay a four cap right now for a C property when I can pay a four, four and a half cap for a B property. So it's a little bit risky. The, you've, you know, our coach has been talking about this, this uh, CapEx tsunami coming, right? All these properties are built in the 60s and 70s. We have to be very careful when we're analyzing deals with CapEx because that's the next bubble I think that's going to happen is that we're overpaying for these C properties. And when you put these things on the contract and then all of a sudden, two years from now, when you go to try to sell or try to refi, the banks come to you and say, hey, listen, mm, there's a lot of CapEx you got to do here. You got to do all this plumbing. You got to do the roof. You got to do the siding. So we have to be worried about where we're buying on the cycle. Um, trying to think of what else what else I'd like to say about syndication before we move on for me it was just a it was just a refine role and it was just I wanted equity Jamie in these deals as much as I could get I was a little ignorant about it now that you jump into syndication there's some real real huge benefits you're using other people's money you're able to leverage into much bigger deals I mean I couldn't do I couldn't have done a 15 million dollar deal just me Jake and my partner Mike it would have been a real big stretch for us to do that right but with syndication we're able to buy bigger deals we were able to scale up the cost segregation when you're a GP on, on a syndication flows a lot through the general partners and you're not even putting a lot of money into these deals, right? That's an amazing part. And the syndication also, it's another business. So it's, it's really, when I started, it was, I didn't, I was afraid. I don't want to use the word afraid, but I was intimidated about taking money from investors. I, I never did that before, right? It was just, you know, if I lose money, it's my money. Now I'm taking money from investors and we have to be very transparent. It's another business. I'm on monthly webinars with our investors talking about our deals, saying what's going on with our deals. How are they doing? How are they not doing? And if we don't get paid, it's a, it's a tough conversation to have and say, you know what? We're not getting paid this quarter because we didn't hit our prefs. Whereas 
five years ago when Jake and I, our septic fields would blow up. Hey, Jake, we're not getting paid for three months. That, that's an interesting conversation to have with your partner, but you can live with it because it's going back into the business. So syndication has so many pros, but there are cons to it. So there's no right answer, Jamie. I think what you did, you started out with a small property. I would tell everybody, the small properties are great. We just sold an eight unit and made a ton of money. I mean, there's nothing wrong with small properties. I mean, you are out there, everyone's out there listening to LinkedIn and, and, and everyone's on Instagram doing 300 units, 200 units. Jake and I always jo joke about that. What are they really getting? They're syndicating a little bit of a deal. It doesn't matter as long as the deal makes sense. We're buying small deals. This deal in, in that we're, uh, we're going to be closing in three months. It's a 48 unit deal. It's not a big deal, but it makes sense for us. So um, that there's that. I want to share a couple of things on my screen, if you don't mind, uh, with, with, um, I, I, pulled, I pulled up for you guys. I just want you to share, show you some resources that we're using. Um, first thing I think everybody should do, if they're going to start syndicating, what we've done is we've created a one sheet. I want everyone to create their own one sheet. I can share these resources with all, with all the people online. You want to have a one sheet. And that, that's where it is with syndication. Syndication is a business. You really have to get yourself going. It's, it's dealing with investors. It's, it's creating a whole different layer, right? It's a whole different responsibility, doing K-1s for investors and all that. So, First thing is I think you should create a one page. That's the very first thing I think everybody should do. I think the next thing is you, you really have to start thinking about core values. You know, what are your core values? You should have this with a partner anyway. I've, I've done a partnership podcast, but I think creating core values and your mission statement, we're a little late to the party on this, Jamie. We've just done this over the last year. I should have done this sooner and really more easy to have more of, that, more of that clarity. And you share this with your investors. So for us, our core values are to improve the lives of others by creating communities that allow people to become the best version of themselves. Now, what does that mean? For us, we have residents now, we have investors, we have education students, we have employees. That's what it's all about, to create all those types of communities. And our, our core values are people first, growth mindset, unwavering ethics, extreme ownership, and make it happen. That's what our core values are. It took us a good six months to get these because we went and coached. So I think everyone who's going to start a syndication company or start syndicating, think about that, what your core values, what your mission statement is. So you can get together with your partners or whoever you're partnering with and you have like minded you, you have, you know, yeah, yeah, you have to have what's that called? You have to have like a symbiotic relationship. You have to be able to work with the person because I know you and Benoit get along really well. You like each other. Could you imagine if your 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 relationship? Eh, but could you imagine if it really sucked and you have to talk to the guy every day or every other day? It's really important to get these core values up front. The next thing is I we have a credibility book, so I think everyone should get their own credibility book. I can share you share mine. It's really a credibility piece. Uh, talking about what your strategy is. Talking about your highlights. Um, next one is. Uh, we have an, I, I can share this is also, I create an eight step due diligence framework for passive investors. When you're syndicating a deal, um, it's not just about you anymore. It's really about the sponsor and it's about the investor. See, that's what, that's the, that's the mind shift when you're syndicating for us. When Jake and I did a deal, it's, Hey, how much money are we make in this month? Where syndication goes, Hey, how much is the investor going to make? And, and even more importantly, look at these questions that I think you should ask them. Hey, should this investor be in this deal with us? Because if the investor wants his money back in 24 months and you're writing a six to 10 year time horizon, that investor shouldn't be in that deal. So you really have to focus on that aspect of it. And then the last document that I just had pulled up is we have a four step underwriting analysis on how to actually start underwriting and looking at these syndications and actually looking at, looking at deals in, in, for them in general. I think the eight step due diligence is important because there's eight steps. Um, anyone getting into syndication, I would just challenge everybody and say to, say to themselves, maybe you should, number one, obviously get educated, listen to all the podcasts you can. That's how I learned. I actually, the podcast was, been, was like a godsend for me because I was actually able to get on there and podcast network with Michael Blank, Reed Goosens, Mark Kenny, Dave Zook. I podcasted all of them, Ivan Barrett, and I learned every single one of them had a little bit of different techniques and different strategies, and I learned from them. So for me, that was really important. But when you're underwriting and you're looking at syndication, maybe you passively invest with the syndicator out there. And I would also tell everybody out there, when you're done with the call, just go online and Google multifamily syndicators and see what syndicators names come up and start opting into their lists and see what kind of emails they send out, see what kind of webinars and presentations they do and look at how they're doing it. Cause everyone does it a little bit differently, but more importantly, see what they're offering. What are the preferred rates of return? What are the co-promotes going on? And that'll really tell you what are the IRRs that they're presenting and how are they underwriting these deals and how are they making these presentations? That's one really great way to know what's going on in the market. So 
I hope that answered the question. I think it does. So there's a couple questions in here, but I want to I want a real quick level set on a couple things because there was a lot of terminology in there. I think I want to make sure people understand, and then we'll get to Sunders and Matt's question. So, uh, Jake or Gino, can you explain a sponsor, a GP, and LP? Just sort of those different those different terms that you meant, just for those that may be sure. a little bit unfamiliar, just to kind yep. of set that baseline. Yeah, sure. So a limited partner is basically limited to the deal. Those are the partners that you're, you're going to bring into the deal. You're going to go out there and you need to, it, it, depending on what kind of deal you're doing, if you're doing a 506B or 506C, that those are the, uh, the regs, uh, you're either going to get sophisticated investors or accredited investors. Now, a 506B is going to have the sophisticated ones. You need to have a substantive relationship if you're going to put somebody in a 506B, and that's really important. And a substantive relationship means that you need to have a couple of touch points, means you need to have the, you know, spoken to the investor, at least by email, by transmission, know what the investor's goals are. So you have to get on. And the, Jamie, the question also was, why didn't I start syndicating? I, we had 600 people on an investor list when I decided to do it. I didn't have the time to get on a call and speak to 600 investors. So I actually had to partner with Dylan Marma, who's head of you know, investor relations. He got on the call weeks and weeks because you need to create substantive relationships because if you find a deal today, Jamie, and you go try to raise money for that deal and you're doing a 506B, you can't find a new investor and put that person into the deal. It's really important that you have the relationship today. So if you're going to start syndicating, you need to start raising capital and meeting people today, start creating that database. So when you do find a deal, you can actually present to them the deal. The uh, co-promote is the GP is a split. So the limited partners are limited to the deal. They're the investors that are going to put money in to your deal. The, the, the split is the, whatever you want to, uh, the co-promote is either it's a 70, 30, the limited partners get 70, 30, 70 percent of the deal. And the general partners get 30 percent of the deal or, 80% of the deal and 20%, whatever way you want to split it up, depending on what you think your internal rate of return is going to be. Now, most sponsors out there are trying to hit a 15% IRR. Three, four years ago, they were at 20%. Three, four years ago, the market was writing for three to five years. Um, now it's five to seven years because we're all expecting that downturn. So we want to have that long, long term fixed rate financing. So if something does happen, we can ride it out. Remember that part of the debt strategy. That's why the debt component, you know, uh, bridge financing might be a little risky right now. So that's part of the problem. And Jamie, another thing popped up in my head. Another reason why I didn't want to syndicate in the beginning was syndication model lends more towards, you know, a fix and flip kind of model where, you know, you're in and when you're first starting out, you need that capital. I wanted to hold these for the longer term. A lot of investors out there, if you try to underwrite for a 10 year hold, a lot of investors, and that was our big mistake on our third investment. If you're holding for, if you're telling an investor, I'm going to hold your money for the next 10 years, the majority of them will tell them you're, you're, you're crazy. You're not going to have my money. Where in reality, I'm, in, I'm actually going to podcast a guy called Sam Freshman. I want you all to look up his name. He's in, he's in his 80s. Uh, really old dude, but he's been doing it for 50 years. And he said his biggest mistake was not holding these assets long term because he sold stuff back in 30 years ago for a million, two million. So what his model is, he doesn't do a return on capital. He tells a return of capital. So if you invest $100,000 with him, he returns all that capital first before giving you a rate of return. So you get all your money back and then he starts giving you interest and in, 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 in interest on the property or whatever the preferred rate of return on the property is. So he's all buy and hold forever. So he's actually said that a lot of people who've invested in him with it passed away People now, his, his, you know, inherited, people have inherited the property and he still owns these properties. So that's what my limiting belief of syndication was that I had to get, you know, I had to get rid of these properties in three to five years. And that you don't have to do that. If you find the right investor base who has IRA, IRA capital or who wants to hold these for the longer term, it's a, it's a good idea to do that. But my limiting belief was syndication. I've got to, you know, get rid of them in two to three years. And that's not the case if you have the right investor base and you can educate them on why it's the right strategy because multifamily is not going away. It's hot. It's really expensive, but you need to know why it's that way. There's money rotating in, into it. You go over, you go, you go overseas. You have a lot of negative interest rates. You have recessions going on all over the world. Money's flowing into the sector and we can spend an hour on demographics. People are renting. That's just, that's just the reality of what's going on. Um, is, it, is it higher? Yes, there's a lot of 1031 money flowing in. The Fed's pumping money into the system. That's why we all know that. So long-term, trying to buy these things and hold these things for the next 10, 15, 20 years, whereas I see, I, I see rentals can continue. I don't see home buying going up like, like rentals that, as far as I see it. I see my kids renting. And then on top of that, student debt is another factor. So you've got a lot of millennials, a lot of baby boomers. They're going to continue to rent. So that's what I see going on. So I thought it was important. Go look at Sam Freshman. He's, a, he's, he's got a, the book is a little complicated to read, but he's been on a couple of podcasts. Listen to him. He's got a great message. 
Damn freshman. Anything but at 80 years old. It sounds like he's more of a senior. But Dude, he called me yesterday. He was on Sunday, and I, if my phone rings, and it says Beverly Hills. So I give the phone to my wife because I think it's a you know, credit card person or something. And she picks up. She goes, it's a guy named Sam. I said, I emailed the guy like 20 minutes ago. It's Sunday at like 12 o'clock. So I'm like, Sam, how you doing? I mean, that's what happens. It's You're the G-Dad. Happen. No, but dude, I mean, like, can you imagine a guy in his 80s? You think he's retired and all? He like he loves what he's doing, right? So yeah. that's there's no such thing as retirement when you love what you're doing. So obviously, you know, I was actually honored the guy gave me a call. He actually said yes. I was surprised because, I mean, he's got some resume. So I'm, okay. I'm looking forward to looking forward to interviewing him. All right. So here's the first question from Sunders. Can you elaborate on how to determine where we are in the economic cycle? Uh, this is the 2010 to 2020, I think was the first decade that we never had, we didn't have a recession. Can you, if you stop and think about that and, and Sam has been through six cycles, Sam freshman, he's been through six real estate cycles. We haven't had a cycle since 2008, 2009. I don't know how much longer it's going to last. I, I think, you know, with this election coming up policy versus, you know, politics, I don't know if the other the Democrats win. I don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea. I mean, he's been lax. Trump's been lax with policy. He's been making a lot of stuff with the tax policy. That's why people are, are fleeing. So I think everyone should really focus on what market they're in. I think we love investing in the Southeast because I think the, the migra migratory patterns are there. I think the tax base is there. I mean, you, and I moved to Florida. There's no state income tax. The weather's great. People are moving here. The cost of living is still great. So look at the markets that are like that. I mean, like, look at Phoenix, look at Boise, look at Salt Lake City. They're really, really hot for a couple of reasons. I mean, one reason is they're all leaving Florida, California and going there, right? So if you can find an emerging market that looks like that, and Tennessee's been like that. So we live in, we, we invest in Knoxville. Nashville's been blowing up. So the money's leaving Nashville and it's been going ever so slightly to the east. Chattanooga's been hot for a while. Now Johnson City's pretty hot in Tennessee and Knoxville is hot because the money's flowing there. So uh, long term, I think, like I said, I think multifamily is great. It's a hard asset. It's something we can control. It's a basic human need. It's food, clothing, and, and shelter. <laughs> we need that. So I don't think you can buy it on the internet. I think one thing that's cool about it is you'll get better with technology. I think technology will make us better investors and make us more efficient. But I think the model of home is, I think that's where it's going to stay. I, I, me personally. Yeah. Does that I make think, sense? You know, absolutely. And I, I think um, uh, to, to, make, to, to further that point, there's no one market, right? There's all these mm -hmm. individual markets. Some markets are very flat. And I think if you're buying with a value add uh, mindset, buying right, as you mm -hmm. would put it, Gino, um, I think that you, you, get, you get saved, if you will, from, from these, these deep sites. Unless you feel like another 2008 is coming, I think you're, you're able to ride this out a little bit easier. The other thing I'll throw out there just for everybody, if, you're, if you want to get deeper into this, we did uh, a video with Jay Scott who went like, like super granular on this. Like he talked about uh, what the hell is that thing called? The yield curve inverting and what Inversion, that means. He yeah. talked about um, why we're, you know, we're at the top of a cycle and the, the normal length of time. I mean, he went into like the weeds. It was only a few months back. Uh, if you go to the youtube.com slash multifamily and more, you'll find there's like, we did it in three parts. It's like an hour total, but it can get really deep on <clears throat> on Jamie, where we are, where he thinks we're going. You know, the problem is, you know, when you don't reach the top of a market, you look back and you go, that was the top. That's the only, that's the only way you're ever going to know. And, and anybody who thinks that they know we're at the top and, and he, it, people have been saying the crash for the last three years. And, and I came to Jacksonville back in 2017, two and a half years ago. And when I moved down here, everyone told me this place is overpriced, right? Crazy prices. They were 65 a door. Now they're 95 a door. And I had listened to everybody. So I'm not saying it's going to go any higher, but What's happened here in the city, and it's probably happening in a lot of places, Amazon opened up a distribution center. Mercedes has got a big distribution center. They're working on the airport. They're doing a dredging the port. Uh, they've gotten you know, military jobs. They've got a huge jo job base and the population growth and all that's going on. I don't know when it's going to stop. I think, it's, I think the pricing is a little bit overpriced. Like you said, you really have to focus on the buy right aspect of it and the manage right, which is just as important because like you said, there's got to be value added onto these properties. But at the same time, I don't know where we are as far as, you know, it's, it's safe to say that we're pretty, pretty far into the, into the cycle. Yeah, we're at the I don't top. Know. Yeah. yeah. I think so. So, all right, Matt mm -hmm. Sieber, you had a question. I, I think it's good. I'm going to unmute you because I want you to, I want you to like elaborate on this a little bit. The question's about, um, uh, equity partners, how you structure the offering. So Matt, I'm going to unmute you if I can, or you unmute you for some reason, not letting me. And if you don't mind, just jump in. How you doing, Matt? Just jump in and, and elaborate on that question. Sure. Um, so when you're offering the syndication to your investors and you can give either the debt equity or, you know, the debt, um, structure or an equity, 
how, how are those different? How do you refinance out? Because my understanding is with the debt partner, you give them a preferred return, um, you know, each year. And then at the end of say your exit at seven or 10 on your refinance, that's when you give them, you know, a, a big lump back. How does it work when you're giving equity and ownership in the property? So when, when we, when you refi in a syndication, most syndicators want to refi the, 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 the people that want to refi their, their, their limited partners out. I wouldn't do that. And a lot of people shouldn't do that because you want to keep them in the deal because it's like, Matt, if I take your money, I've got no money in the deal. The deal works after three years, all of a sudden we're ready to return the capital. Let's say I can return all your capital to you. I give it back to you. How would it feel? It'd feel like, you know what? I just used you and that's it. I, it it's really what you can do. You can structure certain ways. Maybe after, after you've gone certain waterfalls, a certain rate of return, you can do a 50-50 split. So if it was 70-30, after three years, we refi the money out. Bam, it's done. Maybe you go back and do a 50-50 since you've gotten all your capital back and you've, heard, you've hit some certain rate of return. Now, if you got a debt, debt is awesome. I'd, I'd rather give debt than equity. A lot of syndicators out there are giving, let's say, a 10% uh, rate of return, no upside. So in certain, uh, in certain syndications, they're doing that. So uh, a lot of syndicators don't refi. Now, I wouldn't say a lot, but the, a lot of them don't refi. They'd rather take that, take that money, just get that money done and flip into another deal because they're going to get acquisition fees. That's, that's what it is. So they like to sell out and get acquisition fees. But for me, as far as I'm concerned, it's in the PPM. When you structure it in the very beginning, get with your syndication attorney and get clear on what you want to do with your partners. I'd like to keep them in. That'd be awesome. If you can give, the, you can give your investors money back and they're still in the deal and they're cash flowing, they'll like you and they're going to invest in your next deal hands down. So it's a great marketing tool because they're going to tell their friends about it. They're like, dude, this guy gave me my money back and I'm getting another deal with him. So, it, you know, right. and Matt, that's the thing. So remember on that, figure out what kind of debt you're going to get. You want to get prepayment penalty. You don't want to get yield maintenance because if you're going to refi for three or four years, just be careful with that structure, what the exit strategy on that is. So it's important because on one of our deals, our first syndication, we did get stepped down. We got lucky. We're going to be selling the deal in 18 months. We don't, we didn't, it's a syndication. Typically if this is a buy and hold that we'd bought ourselves, we'd, we'd probably refi this and keep it ourselves. But you know what? We're going to, re, we're going to, we're going to sell this thing after 18 months, just return all the capital. We want to do a full cycle deal. So we want to get a deal that's gone full cycle. So we can say to our investors, Hey, we've done a deal. We've opened and closed the deal. So it'll look really good. So, but we got stepped on that just to give us the flexibility. You're going to pay a little bit more in interest rate, but that yield maintenance can kill you. If you're, you're year three and you're, you're crushing a deal and you're like, I want to sell this yield maintenance can really be prohibitive because most of the time you won't be able to, you won't, you will not be able to assume that debt because there's so much equity in the deal. And, and they, and when syndicators want to get their own loan out there, they're going to want to get some interest only on the front end where the three or four or five years and yours would probably have burned off. So just be careful with that, with that debt component. Okay. Hey Matt, can I just clarify? Cause that's a good question. I want to make sure I understand it too. So you're talking about you pitch to your investors about, Hey, I'm, I'm going to give you 70, 30 split. That's option A is kind of the traditional syndication or I'm not going to give you any equity like Gina was saying. I'm just going to give you a 10% return uh, on your money in exchange for debt. So on the back end of that, maybe this is back to Gino. So Gino, if we structure it, so we've got this base of investors who only give us money as debt. They have no equity in this property as a limited mm -hmm. partnership. You're giving them a 10%, almost like interest payment for that yep. debt. At the end of it, three, four, five years, whatever the whole period is. And Matt, tell me if this is what you're asking. Would you leave them in the deal as well, would you would you end up giving them equity? Even that's a good question. I, I I haven't been up against that at all. We haven't even considered that because we haven't even thought about getting giving debt. But if you really think about that, it's a debt. I just I would probably cash them out. That's probably a good component to cash them out because they are debt partners. So <laughs> if they're not equity partners. So but the problem is when you refi, you're probably not going to get all their money back to them. You're probably not getting 100 percent of those proceeds. So you have to figure out what that is. So maybe they'll get 50 percent of their proceeds, but going forward, they're still going to have a 10 percent rate of return or whatever whatever that rate of return is. So. Um, right. Matt, does that, that make sense? It, it does. It does. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Perfect. All right. We've got a question from Jesse Dickens. Um, you mentioned it's hard to syndicate with community banks. Why is that? Is, there's, a, there's a few parts to this question. So why is it hard to syndicate with that. community why? banks? Okay. Well, first of all, with, with the community bank, if your investors are okay with being you know, personally guaranteeing the loan. That's the thing when you're, when you're getting a limited partnership in a syndication, you're usually using agency debt. So agency debt has some component called non-recourse. So it's all you only have recourse to that loan. Now a personal guarantee, when you work with community banks, they want you to personally guarantee, they want you to personally sign on that debt. So what happens if that deal goes south and you lose $300,000, you have to make that deal whole. So when you're doing a syndication, it's a little bit difficult. When we did a, we bought a deal about three years ago that had an HOA component and it had an apartment complex and the HOA. 
And there was not much demand for that because you couldn't syndicate that piece because the apartment complex was great, but agency didn't want that HOA component. So we had to buy the whole deal with community bank without syndication, because if we bring it, if we bring it to our investors, a lot of investors don't want that liability, you know, and also recourse debt is a contingent liability. So it goes on your personal balance sheet. When you refi out to non-recourse, it goes off your balance sheet. So you're able to continue to uh, add debt onto your balance sheet. So um, that's one of the big things. If you're, if you're investors, I mean, the, our partners, me, Jake, and my partner, Mike, we're, we're okay with personally guaranteeing stuff because we're buying it ourselves. So, um, but I'm sure that a lot of investors do not want to be uh, held liable personally for the for these okay. deals. Is there a time frame that you find scares LPs away, like a three, five, seven, 10 year term? Do you, what, do you, I don't know, any, any sense of what the, what the, the sweet spot is right now? Well, Jesse, I think the most important thing is to convey to your investors, what kind of deal are you buying? Cause now we're trying to, we're, we're going to this new model. So we're going to have to try to craft our presentation by saying we're holding for the long term. And I'm actually doing this podcast with Sam Freshman to help us with that model, to help us with that pitch. So we can say, hey, Jesse, I just did a podcast with Sam. He's been doing this for 50 years. This, we're going to follow his model. And I'm going to try to create the podcast based on the pitch that we're trying to do to try to have this long term. I'm thinking a lot of people are probably not going to like the 10 year hold plus. I think who you have to target is people who have IRA money, people who have money in their self-directed IRAs that are not going to touch their money for 10 or 15 or 20 years and just want to let it ride. The, the, the downside is you don't get tax benefits in, an, in a self-directed IRA, but the upside is you're going to get that equity appreciation. You're going to, you're going to get that, that rip going on that, that, uh, yeah, that quarterly payment. I think the other thing is just be careful uh, if you're in a seven or 10 year hold, because we did that on our second syndication. We said, yeah, we're, we're right on the right in this thing for 10 years. And we had a, we have six years IO on this deal. And a lot of people were afraid of that. So we had to back off and say, Hey, listen, we may have the possibility of, you know, within five to seven years of holding it. So I think that's the sweet spot right now. I think the five to seven year hold is the sweet spot right now. If you can do it quicker, People like quicker. It's the velocity of money. They, they want to get their money back and they want to put it somewhere else. So that's where the average investor's mentality is. But I think we're really trying to get this long-term hold and see how that works. I'll let you know how it works. I'm hoping okay. it works. Before we get to the third part of Jesse's question, then we have another one from Matt. I just want to make sure. So just kind of a, a, a check-in because I know not everybody on the call is deep into what syndication is. And we started to talk about a GP and LP and everything else. I want to just level set real quick on that, just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. So <clears throat> you buy a deal, a property and the way that you think about buying a property, right? That's just sort of like a joint venture partnership or you buy it on your own. You go out, you own a hundred percent of a 20 unit building, right? That's your building that you bought with, with debt from the bank. A syndication means that you're finding the deal. You're creating a fund that you take an investor money with, take that investor money, put it on the deal. And in exchange for that, the investor gets a percentage back 10%, 8%, whatever you promise them for a specific period of time, five years, seven years, whatever the mm -hmm. case may be. You as the general partner in that, in that scenario, you and your partners take about 30% of the deal. That means 30% of the equity, 30% of the cash flow, and the rest of the people, your limited partnership, those that are investing in that fund take 70% traditionally, and you can structure that a little bit differently. So I think it's, it's good to understand that because a syndication is a security. You're essentially creating like a stock, like you're, these people are investing in the stock of that mm -hmm. particular apartment community uh, versus just buying it outright. So hopefully that helps. And I think it gets to the next question that Jesse uh, put in here, which is- Jamie, let me, ask, let me add on yeah. to that also. Uh, everyone can now go out there and Google the word, uh, the, the, word the Howey test, H-O-W-E-Y. That will give you guidelines on if you're creating a syndication because a lot of people creating syndications, they don't even know that. If you're taking money from, if I'm taking money from Jamie, he's going to be limited and he's going to be passive and do nothing. And I'm going to take control of the deal. I'm basically creating a syndication. That's what's basically going on. If you have seven or eight people and you want a joint venture with seven or eight people, the SEC may frown on that and go, that's really not a JV because there's no way that seven or eight people are doing, a, doing something or, or being active in the deal. So I would jump on a call with a syndication attorney. We use Kim Taylor. I love her. I think she's a very reasonable, uh, reasonably priced. She's been doing it forever. Uh, you can jump on a call and really work that out with her. But that's really important to figure out if you're creating a syndication, number one. And number two, look at that Howie test and it'll tell you if you are creating a syndication. So- well, that kind of gets at the third question. How many partners on a deal does it take before the SEC considers it a syndication and why do they care? Well, what do you think, Jamie? I mean, well, because why do they care is because you're taking money from somebody with them doing nothing in the deal. So they're limited. So the SEC is trying to, trying, trying to protect investors uh, 
they're trying they're trying to protect the investors and what they're trying to do is between the 506b and the 506c there's a big difference i mean they the whole accredited sophisticated thing is makes me laugh because people can be an accredited investor be really wealthy but know nothing about investing that's that's the thing that makes me mad so you just have to be careful if you're doing a, a 506b with the sophisticated you can't go out and announce on a deal. Hey, I've got a deal. The 506 C I can broadcast everybody, but I can only have a credit investor. I can get on here. And you know, the first couple of deals you do, you're probably better off doing the 506 B because you're going to get friends, family, you know, you're going to know people that you know. Um, and we've done three deals. We're all 506 B's. We've all used mm -hmm. leverage the Jake and Gino community. We've leveraged, uh, you know, all our friends, all our family members. This next deal, we're probably going to go to 506 C. So uh, it just, it just depends. But I think the vast majority of people start with that 506 B because it's easier to raise money from people that know, that know you and that trust you. Yeah. So just to be clear on that as well, when you're creating a fund, a syndication, you can choose between two different funds. Gino mentioned a 506B, a 506C. 506 B, you can, you can get what they call sophisticated investors, which is essentially anybody you know, right? Anybody that you have some sort of relationship with that wants to invest with you, you, you have a 506B, they can invest with you, but you can't go out there and broadcast that. You can't go out and say, hey, I'm, hey everybody, I'm looking for money on a deal. It's just, mm -hmm. that's what the rule is. That they're protecting the sophisticated investor, the non-millionaire is probably the best way to put it. The accredited investor can also invest in your 506B, but they can exclusively invest in a 506C if you create it that way. So you're catering to only millionaires and you can broadcast because there's an assumption that, like Gino said, with They're money, savvier. knowledge, but that's probably not a, a correct assumption uh, in all cases. So, and one of the one of the funny things is, I think the SEC is actually trying to loosen their guidelines because they they've are. seen they've seen that uh, a lot of people that make money in these deals are these 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 private deals that are only for accredited investors. So they're saying maybe my rule, they, maybe the rules aren't so fair because these sophisticated investors are locked out of these deals that are broadcast out and only only available to the accredited investor type. So keep an eye on that. That's what it's happening right now. It's going through right now. I don't know what's going to happen going forward, but I saw that there's a shift going on because I see yeah. a lot of these, a lot of these deals are, are, you know, you can't get into them if you're not accredited. And that's where people are making money on these deals. So it's all Dodd-Frank stuff, right? I mean, this mm -hmm. is essentially post 08 Dodd-Frank, you know, mm -hmm. when the market crashed, they put structure in place to protect everybody from, from, you know, the markets or from predatory uh, uh, investors or whatever the case may be. And to the mm -hmm. question, Gino, you mentioned like, what do I think that I'm not an attorney, neither is Gino, none of us on this call, I don't think are. Um, but listening to different uh, SEC attorneys talk about it, they tend to get a little bit like, you know, eh, you're kind of bordering on needing a security here when you have five partners or more. So just, again, that's from me listening to others. That's not my thing. Talk to your attorney and figure out uh, what's best for you. So, you know, this next question comes from Matt, and I, I like this question because I think it gets to, um, you know, something that a lot of people are looking for. So his question, like very directly is if I apply online for mentorship, like with, with wheelbarrow profits or whatever, does that mean that, you know, he's on the hot list, if you will, to, to be, uh, to, if you, if he finds a deal, you'll fund it or work with him to fund it or whatever the case may be. And so that's the kind of the general question, I think, and Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, or the specific question, but the more generalized question on that is like, how does that work? How does an organization like yours, you know, who has students or who has members or who has people in a, in a mastermind or investor class or whatever, how does that work? If, if I sign up for the Jake and Gino program, do I then get, you know, access to capital that maybe I don't have if I don't, or what does that look like? Well, I think the first thing when you sign up for mentorship is you have to learn the whole structure, right? You have to learn the buy, right? You have to learn the manage, right? You have to learn the finance, right? We've done syndicate right now. And you have to learn partnership. You have to learn how to structure partnership. And on top of that, with all the events that we have, we've created a network that you can go out there and actually raise money through the platform, the, through the private Facebook group, through going out to these different events, their internal events. We have money mixers three times a year. That's where you're going to ultimately raise your capital. Uh, we're doing this first one to deal with the students, uh, with the student, because it's a great deal. Uh, they brought us a 52 unit. We're partnering with them. We're always looking for deals with, from our students. Uh, and if they bring a good deal to us, we will. We will partner with them. But that's not ultimately why I created Jake and Gino. I wanted to create it because I wanted to get Jamie, Benoit, uh, I wanted to get Jesse all together. And all of a sudden, they can start working at deals. And more importantly, when you guys are in different markets, there's boots on the ground. So there's so many different ways to get in, in, into, the, into the investment. Like you guys, Benoit's in Florida, Jamie's in, in Michigan. You guys partnered up together. You learned the system. You got together. You started raising capital. I think that's, that's one, of the, one of the best ways to do it. And I don't think anybody has to start with syndication. Like I said, I'd rather start with a smaller deal. Proof of concept, 
then from that deal, create the credibility book and then start going into bigger deals. But it all depends on how much capital you have. It all depends on what kind of market you. And if you're in a capital market, that's capital intensive, like San Francisco, like New York, as opposed to a deal market that may be like Knoxville where you're finding more deals that also lend to what your strategy is going to be. Cause if you can raise capital and find a market that has those deals, maybe you partner with somebody in that market that has those deals that you're raising the capital. So that's a strategy that I would employ depending on what market you're in. Okay. So the next question from Garrett is, would you be paying for 100% of the property or just a down payment? Garrett, if you can unmute and elaborate just a little bit on that, I want to make sure I understand. Are you speaking about if you're syndicating or that question might've come up in, while we were talking. So it might be specific to one thing. Um, if you were syndicating and raising money, um, would you collect enough money to essentially pay 100% for the property or are you just raising enough money to pay for the down payment, you know, 20 or 30% and due diligence of the deal? You are paying, you are, you are collecting, you're doing your due diligence, you're doing your budgets, you're doing for the down payment. So, in this, there's so many ways to get creative. In a syndication, you need to have money up front before you close the deal. So do you need to have that? You need to raise that money or do you have that money in your back pocket? You need money for, you know, getting a loan, locking a loan up. You need money for a down payment. You need money to pay an attorney. You're going to get all this money back, but you need it up front. So I know people out there that actually fund these deals and get a little part of the general partnership for bringing that capital to the table day one. Maybe somebody out there can do that. So, and it can be, you know, on a $10 million deal, that can be substantial. That can be a couple hundred thousand dollars that you need to put down on that deal. Then when you start raising the money, a lot of the deals out there right now, agencies looking for between 65 and 70% loan to values. So you're going to need about 30% of the, of the capital on that deal. So if it's a $10 million deal, you may, you may, may need to have $3 million to put in that property. So that's the capital you raise. And Garrett, on top of it, you need to do a budget. So on our first syndication, we knew that we needed to spend $3,000 per unit to turn every unit. There's 130 units. We raised an additional $400,000. Now there's a pro and a con to raising additional capital. The pro Pro is you don't have to sweat. You don't have to have any capital calls. You have that money in the bank that you can use to turn the property that CapEx. The con is an extra $400,000 to raise paying 8% is we have to pay an additional $32,000 a year on that money that we have raised. So that's painful because you've got to get that money out. But on our first indication, we didn't want to have any issues. I'd rather lose a little bit of money by paying out a little bit more, but raising enough. And if you have some money left over, you can always distribute that back to the investors. I'd rather have a little bit more money raised on the front end on your first one or two deals than come up short and say, I need a capital call. That's the worst thing that could possibly happen is not raising enough capital. So doing a budget, knowing exactly what you need to do, what CapEx items need to get done, have that money raised also with the deal. Yeah. So I want to, I want to uh, take that a little further before we get to Napoleon's question. I really like Napoleon's question here, but uh, uh, you know, talk about, so you're, so real quick, just to kind of further that. Um, if I were starting a syndication or if Ben and I do a syndication, you want to make sure you have what's called your at-risk capital in hand, or I guess you can raise it, but that's like your, your, uh, your uh, environmental, your uh, inspection, your earnest money deposit, all of that stuff up front that you mm -hmm. can get reimbursed once you close the deal you to will. your investor base, but yes. you have to have that kind of up front, right? So you, you need that cash somewhere. Yes. Then from there, you raise the rest. Now, we talked about raising the down payment. So you would, Garrett, to answer your question directly, you would likely get bank financing for 70 to 80% of the, of the actual cost of the, of the purchase. Um, but you're also raising for, like he said, capital expenditures, things like that. But you know, talk about fees. So in a syndication mm. model, you're also going to collect, say, a 2 3% acquisition fee, a 1%, 2% asset management fee, maybe a disposition fee. When you sell the property or refi out, you might get 2 or 3% for that work. Um, I, like you, where, I like where Jamie's head is. See, he's thinking about fees. I'm not even thinking about getting paid on this thing. That's the most important <laughs> thing you need to raise. You got to get paid, right? So 2% of a $6 million deal is $120,000. That's going into the line items. That's going into the closing costs. So that money needs to get raised from investors. So that goes in there also. So, you know, depending on your first deal, how you feel comfortable. That's why, you know, we haven't really talked about the size of a syndication. What do you feel comfortable doing? Is it worth syndicating a million dollar deal, a deal that's only worth a million dollars, doing all this work, getting all these documents prepared, raising, trying to raise capital for that. It's probably not worth doing a deal that small. I'd rather do, cause you're only going to get paid $30,000 on the top end to do a million dollar deal if you get a 3% acquisition fee. So maybe the cutoff for somebody would be maybe two, two and a half, $3 million deal. So it depends also, you know, on your credibility on your first deal, how much can you charge? We charge 3% as an acquisition fee. Uh, our second deal is $15 million. We charge a 3% acquisition fee for that. Also, Vinny Chopra, 
He closed a deal about six months ago, a $50 million acquisition, a $50 million deal. He got a 4% acquisition fee. He got $2 million to do that deal. Now, Vinny's kick-ass. Vinny, Vinny is, as people would say, he's gangster. He's awesome. But the reason why he did that is because he's got credibility. He's, 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 he's returned capital to his investors and he's got the credibility. So he's not going to start, he didn't start out with a 4% acquisition fee. So figure out what your fee structure is, figure out how you want to get paid. I think, I think between two and 3% acquisition fee is fair. There's a lot of work involved. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things to manage. You're taking all the risk. You're signing on those papers. Your name is going on that debt. So you're taking a lot of risk, even though you might not be putting in at risk capital, although most indications you need to put in about 10%. Uh, post, you know, what you can do is you can roll your acquisition fee into equity, but a lot of banks want you to see you put in additional capital on top of that. So on ours, we put in uh, about 15% on our first deal, which is great because we're getting paid as limited partners. So we're, we're on the general partner side. And then on the limited partner side, if you put in $100,000, you're getting an 8% preferred rate of return. So I'm getting money on the LP side also. So that's a great thing about, about investing in your own syndications. You're getting on the LP and the GP side. And Jamie, you talked about certain other uh, fees. You get an asset management fee, depending on how you want to structure it, you can do a percentage of gross rents collected or you can do a percentage of capital raised. For us, we did a percentage of capital raised. We raised $2.6 million. We charged a 1% asset management fee and it comes out to $26,000 a year. So that just stays basic. Those are fees to, you know, to pay for CrowdStreet, to pay for the uh, CRM, to pay for uh, you know, payroll, to pay for all that stuff. That's not a property management fee. That's an asset management fee different than a property management fee. And I think the other one that, that investors, uh, syndicators like charge, they'll charge a disposition fee or they'll charge a uh, refi fee. So if you refi it out, they'll charge a 0.5%, which can be substantial. If you're getting a nice, nice refi or nice sellout, they'll, they'll charge that also. I think the other one is construction management. If you're managing and you're property managing a property and you're doing a million dollars rehab, they may charge a 10% construction management fee. They may charge a hundred grand to the investors. But Garrett, the most important thing is you can only charge these fees if it works in the deal. You can't fee the deal to death and, and worry about that. So you really have to be you know, crystal clear. And does this deal make sense? And if you're only doing the deal for fees in the long run, you're going to get burned out. You're going to lose deals. So just be really crystal clear. I, like I said, two to 3% for an acquisition fee, I think is really fair in, in, in this environment right now. No, that makes sense. Yeah. So I love this question from Napoleon because it's a, it, I love the action on this. So he's got two partners. They've, they're getting deal flow. God bless you. Um, we have investors lined up as well, but they're having difficulty kind of converting those investors from verbal commitment, it sounds like. Or maybe it, he's saying we're having trouble getting investors to commit. So what guidance might you have to kind of lock down when somebody says, hey, I'd love to give you, I'd love to go in $50,000 on your next deal. What guidance do you have to get investors to truly commit? So Napoleon, what's what's hold, what what is this? What's the, what's the holdback? Why are they why are they not committing? So a lot of my investors are well. I have like five to ten uh, friends that want to invest with me, but a lot of the investors that have deep pockets is, is funneled through my um, father-in-law, and he has access to these people with deep pockets. But uh, it seems like he's one track minded as far as like where, where this deal should go. And, you know, it, it has to go through him in, in other words. So I'm trying to convince him to like, um, to, to commit and, and just um, convey that information to these investors. Are you speaking to, are you speaking to, you need to speak to the investors also. I think from a sales, from a sales perspective, I learned one thing and I really hate to use it, but scarcity works the best. And, and, and read the book, Pitch Anything by Oren Claff. That book has revolutionized the way I think because when you're, when you're doing a deal, if they smell that you're desperate, you're not going to raise capital. But if you can say to them, hey, you know what? And it's happened to us and we have, we've done it without even meaning to do it. We, we, need, we, need, we need to raise $2.6 million. First come, first serve. And that's it. And then, and then you need to raise. And like that, like I said, we had that problem with the 10 years. Once we throttled down, we said five to seven, we had no problems because people wanted to get in and it's first come first serve that scarcity mindset, fear of losing out. You know, this is a great deal. You have to convey to them why they should, why they should invest in this deal. And that scarcity works better than anything else. But you need to speak to those investors yourself. You need to hear it from your words, not from, not from somebody else's words. Why? Because they're investing ultimately in you. They're investing in the sponsor and you have to show that your credibility, you have to create all, that, all those docs that I have and send the stuff over to them and talk to them about the deal and why this deal makes sense. Okay. Okay. 
Hey, I'll add to that because I got this advice. I had a similar question, so I was really curious about the answer. And I think that's an amazing answer. And I got this advice from a, um, uh, a, a, a former broker, a friend of mine and a former broker. And his point was like, hey, you got to get them in the mindset of, okay, yeah, sounds good. I'll invest with you too. Okay, can I picture putting my money in with you consistently? So if you got deals, make offers, present those offers, every one of them to your investors every time. So it gets them in the like, oh, okay, so you might close it. Even if you know there's no shot, you know, bring the deal to them and say, this is what I'm offering on this one to get X return. Um, so just getting your ready, I'll let you know how it turns out. So they started getting the mindset of like, all right, this guy's dealing, this guy's got some action kind of behind him. So uh, it was kind of a cool tip from, uh, from that guy. Now, Kelly, Pauline, put a, go let, ahead. Let, me, let me just mention one more thing. I'm creating something for the Jake and Gino community of a, a program on how to pitch and, and how, to, how to raise capital. I'm, I'm going to call it the three elements of a pitch. The first book that, I, that, that, that really moved me is that Oren Claff is Pitch Anything. I think the second book is, uh, that I loved is uh, Influence by Robert Cialdini. So you really have to read that book. And when you create your pitch, it's all about authority, liking, commitment and consistency, social proof, all those, right? So read the second book, Weapons of Influence. You're going to put that into your pitch, right? And the third one, uh, I'm actually podcasting Kendra Hall on Wednesday. And she wrote a book that says story. She wrote a book that I think it's called Stories That Sell and, and really creating a story. If, if I got into the psychology of it right now, you're probably pitching them, as Oren Claff would say, from your from your neocortex, from your analytical brain, and you think you're pitching them to their neocortex, when in reality, you're pitching them to their, what we call the croc brain, the primitive brain, the BS brain. You're trying to talk about 8% preps and why this deal is great, and they're like, this guy's BS. You have to build rapport with them, and really, you have to create a story, and that's what it's all about. And if you read her story, the her book third, you're going to start creating a story, your narrative of why you're in multifamily, and really try to bait them. And if you, if you read those three books, and, and you really start thinking about how to create the pitch, it's going to really help you out a lot because they have to believe in you, first of all, and they have to believe in multifamily. And if you can tell them why multifamily, like I just said, is 150 million baby boomers and millennials, what do you think they're doing? They're renting. You know, this is a hard asset. It's a basic human need. If you can get into that storyline and make them want multifamily, that's the first step. And then the next step, it's a hard asset. What's going on with the Fed? Inflation, 1971, the gold standard, we're gone. We, the money's lost 95% of its value. This is a hard asset. I can touch it. I can control it. Once you start presenting that, the brain sees as it's something different. There's movement going on. Then you can start talking about, oh, well, you want to hear about it. And the other thing that I remember, I was on a podcast with uh, Corey Peterson, Great question that he asks everybody. He asks everybody, hey, do you know anybody who wants uh, to invest in multifamily? Ask, ask your friends that. And two things will happen. They'll either say, hey, what about me? Then you qualify. Then they're interested. Or maybe they have somebody that they'll give you a name to. So use that in your, in your, in your quest to find to raise capital. I love that question. That was a great question. He gave it to us on a, on a podcast. So love use it. that. Love it. Callan, you put a, a slash in there. I don't know if that was a mistake or if you had a question. I don't know where you are on my screen here, but Callan, yeah, yeah it looks mistake. like you're open. Go ahead. I fat fingered it. What's that? It was a mistake. I fat fingered it. <laughs> Not a problem. Not a problem. <laughs> we got a couple more in there. So Hendra is asking, what's your suggestion for introducing a new market to your investor list? Uh, I love that question. The first thing I would say is, Number one, why new market? It, it, it explain to them what's going on with the market. Number two, Hendra, in the credibility book, you've got to get a lot of OMs and a lot of data on figure out why the new market. And um, you can always tell them the old market doesn't have enough deal flow. There's not enough deal flow going on over there. There's, you know, there's, it's, it's overpriced. I'm seeing four caps. I don't like that market. I'm going to a new market. That's, that's probably the way you would, I don't want to say pitch, but that's why we left Knoxville because Knoxville is, is limited supply. We want to continue to grow our base. And we ended up going within a three hour radius. We're vertically integrated. So we said, we're going to draw a map three hours. So we went to Louisville. We're in Lexington. We're going to Charleston now. So that's how, we're, that's how we're doing it. For us, it was basically deal flow. We didn't have enough deal flow and, and the market in Knoxville was getting, was getting a little bit hot. So we wanted to try something different. So that's how, that's how I would pitch it and present it. Makes sense. Okay. And then Roland's got a kind of a multiple part question. The gist of it is how do investors feel if they do it all about development deals? So he's talking about a 36 unit A-class building stabilized mm -hmm. uh, and it's approved for 68 new units to be developed, you know, does that, does that scare people off from investing or do they not know? Well, that's the thing. So the, what is your investor's appetite? So for us, our investors do not want heavy lifts. They don't want 
not having 8% preferred rates of return for the next 18 months. They don't want to have that, to have that delayed gratification. So our, for us to pitch that kind of deal would be very difficult. Now, development, if you can develop an asset for 140, 150 a door for a brand new build, I mean, that's just awesome. I just don't know where we are in the cycle right now. I'm scared, but the money's still cheap and, and you know, builders will build until they don't build anymore. So for me, it's really telling the story. Why, why should an investor tell, uh, why should an investor invest with you in that new build? What you could possibly probably say to them is I'm buying, I'm building a brand new building. There's going to be no deferred maintenance. It's going to be easy to manage, right? There's It's going to be brand new, no deferred maintenance. And you, you, you talk about those things, but then the downside is, Hey, you're not getting paid for the next 36 months or 20, whatever that, whatever that process is. You're just going to have to figure out if your investor base has an appetite for that. I know for us, it'd be hard to do that. And we're not in the development space. So that'd be a credibility issue for us. All of a sudden, we've been doing these deals, unless we, of course, partner with somebody who's in the space that's been doing it, that has credibility. So for us, we just have to figure out, figure out that. And we're buying newer assets now. So for us, it's the same thing. Our model is not as much mom and pops. They're still mom and pops, but they're newer builds. And the reason why we're going to newer builds is what I was talking about, the market cycle the three phases, the market cycle where we are right now. We don't want to buy those older assets. We're trying to get the newer assets. And that was part of the story. Why are we doing that? Because we're going to get long-term fixed rate financing. So when the market does go down, those C assets, we didn't buy them here. We bought them down here. So when the market resets, we've got long-term fixed rate financing. We can ride through the wave. We can hold out. So that's how we created the, We're going to create okay. the story for our investors. All right. So uh, we got a couple minutes left. I wanted to, I wanted to do something here real quick. So you, you, Gino mentioned Sam Freshman as a guy to go out there and check out, learn a little bit about mm -hmm. his content. So you get a sense of a seasoned syndicator and what he does use the Howie test to determine whether or not you're treading into the area of a syndication versus mm -hmm. just kind of a straight partnership deal. Uh, and then a couple of books around pitch anything and stories that sell um, are, are great ways for you to figure out how to bring your investors. If you haven't, if you're trying to attract investors in on your deal, we talked about 506 B we talked about 506 C. So a lot of stuff, um, you know, if somebody now gets, okay, I get all that. What are the next two or three things or who are the next two or three people I need to have in my, in my circle? Who do I need to partner with or what, who do I need to bring on my team? Like what are the next few things people need to do if they're thinking about syndicating, whether they've never invested in anything, whether they've invested in some stuff and they're stepping up to the syndication model. That's like an hour question. Whew. <laughs> I mean, the first thing is why do real estate? I mean, base really, I mean, why are we getting into real estate? That's specific to everybody. Um, the second thing is, is syndication appropriate for you, right? Or, do you, or are you more comfortable uh, doing syndication? You don't have to do syndication. I mean, there's so many different ways of getting into it. Does it work for you as a model? Because it's only one tool, right? I think the next step is try to figure out all the different responsibilities in syndication, right? You can, you can do day-to-day. -day. You can raise capital. You can be a net worth deal sponsor right? Those are three things you can do right there. And you can find deals, underwrite deals. Those are four major responsibilities of syndication. Maybe you choose one and then you go out and look for partners that you stink at. So for us, Jake and I, we couldn't speak to investors. We just didn't have the time. So we fill that bucket in by finding Dylan and he does a great job on the phone with the investors. Jake runs these properties day to day. And I basically with the education, help us raise the capital. So it's really a team effort. Syndication is a team effort. You don't have to do it by yourself. And it allows you to get into bigger deals. That, that's the great thing about it. Is what's great about it is you can actually create a business with syndication because you can buy a 100-unit property and you can buy, get a property manager and you can get a maintenance tech to do all this work and actually create a business that way. So that's what I love about syndication. And you got the asset management fees, which helps you out a little bit also. And you can put some of your own capital on the LP side, like I said, and cash flow that way. Because in syndication, especially in the last you know, year, 18 months, two years, there's not a lot of cash flow for syndicators on the front end, unless you're doing a catch up. If you do something, I don't want to get into the catch up right now, but you're getting an acquisition fee day one. So there's your cash flow, a lot of it. So get into it for the right reasons. We got into it because it was just another tool in the toolbox it was able to expand our base of investors. And we were able to actually just lever up and really get our portfolio even bigger. And ha you know, with our property management company, we we're able to expand that aspect of it through the syndication model. All right. You want to rapid fire a few questions here? Sure. All right. So the first one is for investors investing with their retirement funds, like a self-directed IRA or solo 401k, what is the most important metric IRR cash on cash or some other metric for them? Well, I mean, for self-directed, 
probably, you know, cash on cash. I, I, I'd, I'd want to get as high of a rate of return with my self-directed as possible, right? I mean, that's, you know, self-directed is going advance to ira.com. They've got a great website. Get all their information out there. They talk about solo 401ks. You can't sell deal. It's the perfect model to LP, actually, just to put money in LP. But like I said, you don't get the tax benefits of it. That's all. But use that if you're a syndicator and pitch that to investors because 50% of our capital on this last deal we did in Lexington came from IRA money. It was amazing. And start the process early. Get somebody who's a, who is, uh, who, who works with, who works with, whether it's Advanta IRA, whatever company you're using out there, equity trust, get them out there and make sure you start that process early. Cause it's going to take a couple of weeks for them to switch over from, from their 401k, roll it into a self-directed IRA. And then when you're raising capital, you don't want to get stuck and saying, Hey, my money's not there yet. So start that process as soon as possible. So Laura, Lauren, it's Advanta, A-D-V-A-N-T-A IRA. If that's what you were looking for. I've yep. used them as well. Thanks to Gino, but they're um, good. Yeah, they're really they are. Good. And I think it's a good point that, uh, that you make real quick is, is like when people think about raising money, I think they picture some guy with like dollar bills falling out of his pocket, but most capital is, pro I should say most, a lot of capital is raised, but people having, a, they were in a job, they had $150,000 in their 401k at that job. Mm -hmm. And they since have rolled that over to an IRA or a solo 401k and it's kind of sitting there. Maybe they haven't invested in the stock market, but they can pull that and deploy it into your deals. Now that money yes. goes back into the IRA and it's for their future retirement. That's why they're limited partners. They're not doing anything on these deals other than collecting cash. But that's where the, a lot of money comes from. So get educated on what an IRA is and how to pitch to investors on that. Because they're going to be like, I don't have any money. It's like, well, do you have a 401k, that you, an old 401k? Do you have an IRA? Because then they're like, oh yeah, I do. I can invest that for you and give you a better mm -hmm. return than you're going to get in the stock market. I that's mean, a great yeah. point. Right. Excellent point. So yep. make sure you know that. Um, another hot or uh, quick question here. Can we get the first slides of your presentation? I think you mentioned you might send those to me. I can forward that to folks. Oh yeah, I'll do that. Yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll attach them on email, email to you. You can send them out to everybody. Sure. I'll definitely okay. do that. Um, how many deals do you have in Louisville? Uh, this is Delbert. That's his backyard. He met you in Orlando and he loves you, loves you. So how Delbert. many deals do you have in, uh, in Louisville right now? We have two. We have 130 units and we have a 243 unit deal in Louisville and we have one in Lexington. And Louisville is one of those markets that is just, it's sort of under the radar, but it's not. And it's got a lot of manufacturing jobs. It's got a lot of growth and the airport is expanding there. So uh, there's a lot of good stuff going on in Louisville, but it's catching up. I mean, it's just catching up like everywhere else. The money's getting deployed there. I love Lexington. It's a nice little city barrier to entry there. I wish we could buy more in Lexington, to be honest with you. It's a great, great city. All right, Melody, your question, is it possible for an investor to lose money when investing as an LP? Yes. Any, oh, yes. any investments carries risk. So um, yes, the answer to that uh, in a short way is just because we're out of time. Gino, yes. where, uh, website, what do you want to, what do you want to leave folks with where they can learn more about you, learn more about what Dude, you're Dude, I can't believe an hour is up already. What, what happened? goes fast. Holy crap. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> Best hour of my day. As I always tell my kids, uh, just go to Jake and uh, go to Jake and forward slash honeybee. We got a couple of videos on there. If you want to check out the new book we wrote, multiple streams of revenue and, and the syndication model really ties into the honeybee really because syndication is another stream of revenue, right? You're, you're raising capital, you're putting money into deals. You have that asset management fee going on. So it's a, yeah, Napoleon, I like that, huh? <laughs> It's a great book. I mean, it'll give you some ideas. It's not always how, ah, I even oh, signed them for you. Ah, <laughs> yeah. How about that? It's not always, you always figure out, we always ask how to do it. Sometimes it's always a good way to ask somebody who can do it. So, um, and syndication is a great, is a great way to, great way to think on that also. So. No doubt. Gino, thank you so much for your time tonight, brother. I, I, I can't thank you enough. My pleasure, it's dude. Always informative, always insightful. And, uh, yeah, well, uh, I'm sure it sounds like we'll probably have a million more questions, but uh, we'll have to get to those at another time. So I'll get Thanks, that stuff everybody. from Gino. I'll send it all out to, to the group leaders so that you guys can get it. And uh, yeah, thanks all of you for attending tonight. We'd love your feedback on tonight. We'll do more stuff like this and we'll go from there. So have a wonderful evening. Gino, thanks again, man. Take care, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Ciao.